Tom Blake, A Surfer's Philosophy, Part 2, The Circle of Compassion. I knew I didn't want to be killed, and I figured all animals felt the same way. I have been a vegetarian since 1924. Tom Blake, The Uncommon Journey. Today, being a vegetarian or a vegan is much more commonplace than it was in years past. This is due to a variety of influences, not the least of which is a growing awareness that eliminating red meat is a health-promoting practice. Thus, it is quite remarkable that Tom Blake decided to become a vegetarian in 1924 at the age of 22. At that time, there were very few people who abstained from meat, and those who did were often disparaged as strange health nuts, or worse, backward Hindus. It appears Blake was influenced by the burgeoning health movement that was growing at that time in Southern California. Recollects Blake, the San Fernando Valley had many fruit orchards, and the owners would let you have all the fruit you could find after the pickers went through. It was at this time I was introduced to the personal health movement and became a vegetarian. I depended on my health for my swimming and lifeguard work. Although health was a primary concern for Blake's switch to a vegetarian diet, it also dovetailed with his overall ethic of increasing his circle of compassion to include other life forms. As Blake wrote, Israel's Judaism, India's Hinduism, Islam, Buddhism, China's Confucianism, Christianity, in essence, carry the same theme. Man's awareness of his unity with all things. Blake also saw his vegetarianism as dovetailing with what he took as the first real commandment of Judaism and Christianity. Thou shalt no kill. He also emphasized the golden rule as taught by Christ, as well as the writings of the ancient philosophers and Hindus. The work of Eharat and Jackson also had their influence. Now all those good teachings blend with the findings of the science of nutrition, proving in fact that which man has known by instinct from time immortal. At the age of 41 years, Blake provided the American vegetarian with a distillation of his dietary habits. As a member of the U.S. Coast Guard for 14 months serving somewhere south of Alaska, I can say we get the finest food in the world, and plenty of it. I pass up the meat, fish, and fowl, but the variety of other food is extensive and sufficient to balance a diet. There is a salad or fruit at every meal, as well as butter and milk. In his talks with the young Anthony in the desert later in his life, Blake elaborated on vegetarianism and his ethical reasoning behind it. I consider being a vegetarian a prime factor in my well-being, the main reason for surviving to the age of 85. Vegetarian meals are more healthful than the denser, chemical-laden foods, which tend to clog up arteries and capillaries when one overindulges. Vegetarian foods are more forgiving. It also eliminates the need to kill or share the burden of responsibility for the killing of God's creatures. Thousands of years ago, vegetarianism was practiced by Hindu people of India. All this points up a way of seeking the better life and encouraging others to do the same. In a word, respect for life, your own, and all of the earth's living creatures. They too are of nature's kingdom. Blake's moral arc was grounded in the science of his day, and he felt strongly that the best of religion could be substantiated by a deep study of the ocean. He was a realist, however, and didn't overly romanticize nature, since he understood all too well its cruelties. As Blake pointed out, nature is without sentiment. Although Blake doesn't mention Darwin or evolution in any length in his writings, it is clear that he understood what the theory portended and how life, temporary as it is, was a struggle for existence, especially where there is a scarcity of resources. But despite nature's ultimate indifference, Blake's philosophy is a very positive one, and he was willing to focus on a longer view of things, accepting in the process that man's former religious ideas have been superseded by a more accurate and robust scientific understanding, underlining that the old meaning of spiritualism died when Einstein identified energy as equivalent of mass. Then energy became real and replaced the mystery of spiritualism. Anything and everything has to be considered and dealt with in our daily lives. The ethic and moral of Jesus was compassion for all life. Blake was not an absolutist in his philosophy, since he clearly realized that compassion must be balanced by compulsion to survive. Because of this, 
one must follow certain instinctual laws while attempting to transcend our more animalistic tendencies. For Blake, this entails being willing to pay the price for certain errors of judgment and learning how to align oneself with the natural ebb and flow of differing circumstances. This earth, according to Blake, will never be a utopia, but we can optimize the best that it has to offer while minimizing those aspects that are damaging or harmful. As Blake realistically explains, we must pay a price for all error or transgression of nature's rules. Our so-called sins are not forgiven by nature or God. Therefore, we must know truth from error, right from wrong, an impossible goal at our present stage of knowledge for any one person. Among the living species, we find a mutual respect and a certain sense of security for members among their own kind. Should we expect less of humanity? I believe not, for there must be a certain togetherness and trust, but not necessarily love for each other. For me, the word love is reserved for special relationships such as those that exist between parent and child, but respect for all else. Blake, in a somewhat unique, even if unusual, coupling, wants to marry Jesus' high moral code with Einstein's atomic theory and suggests that both are necessary for an enlightened life. It should be noted, however, that Blake is not a Christian apologist, since he doesn't hold to biblical inerrancy or any of the standard dogmas. Rather, he emphasizes those features that can be ascertained without indulging in mere theological speculation. In this regard, Blake is more in accord with Aldous Huxley's perennial philosophy that sees an undercurrent of truth and its applicability in almost all the world's religions. Blake even holds a karmic view on thought and reaction something that is common in such Eastern religions as Hinduism, Jainism, Buddhism, and Sikhism, as he employs science to support his contention that Einstein's cosmic energy field of matter is real, something that affects us. We cannot escape its reward or its sting, much but not all, depending on our own personal conduct and actions. Surely sow and reap in kind sooner or later has ageless truth, is retroactive, and so the net result of nature equals God concept points up the absolute necessity of observing the rules of our species for survival and well-being. Blake's moral injunction, which is echoed throughout varying cultures, essentially do unto others as you would like have done unto you, reminds me of a sage I once met in North India named Fakir Chand, who was renowned for his meditative prowess and his disarming honesty and frankness. Fakir long argued that even one's own thoughts have a karmic basis and were not merely ephemeral nothings but genuinely part and parcel of the physical universe and as such follow certain unaltered laws. Blake pithily summarizes this same viewpoint when he wrote, Everything, even thought, is real and responds to the law of sow and reap. Blake lived a solitary existence and some, like Doc Ball, regarded him as a loner. Though he did keep to himself, Blake felt a kinship with all life. I found my greatest interest in swimming, surfing, and camping, traveling around, and that. It's a lonely life, that's true. But your friends are the trees and the forests and the birds and the animals. And anything that you can see and the different people that you meet briefly every day was new. Yet, perhaps Blake's greatest contribution to humanity was not in his surfing prowess or his heroic swimming feats, but rather in developing new products to help save people from drowning. Not only was Blake himself a lifeguard at various stages in his career, but he also invented and or developed such life-saving tools as the torpedo buoy and rescue ring, besides dramatically modernizing the surfboard. From making the first hollow board to adding a fin skeg to making a modified sailboard. Blake was indeed a man of many parts, and yet what stands out most is his humanity his love of the ocean and what it has to offer, and the infectious enthusiasm he brought to each of his creative endeavors, the surfer's way of life. In the early days, we surfed purely for pleasure and health that we derived from it. Tom Blake, Interview 1989. Once when I was attending an NEH conference at the University of Hawaii in the summer of 1993, one of the professors commented about how surfers tend to view the world through a different lens, I asked, how so? He replied, they are more easygoing and less clock conscious. To which I responded, yeah, but surfers are very aware of time when it comes to a freshly arrived swell. 
This got me to thinking about how surfers live in general and how it evolved. While it is not accurate to claim that Tom Blake invented the surfer lifestyle, since anyone who loves riding waves must by that very love alter how they schedule their days, weeks, and months. His life is nevertheless illustrative of how a dedicated surfer prioritizes his responsibilities. It was a typical cliché in Hollywood movies about surfers that they were viewed as beach bums, who were more interested in partying than in securing a steady job. Indeed, a close analysis of the famous 1959 movie Gidget and the sappy 1964 movie Ride the Wild Surf reveals it to be a moral play about whether an adult male should get a steady job or simply follow the sun and surf. Blake had to break societal expectations to embark on the kind of life he chose, since the cultural mores of his time were against those who wanted to live more freely without a typical nine-to-five job. Surfers who followed swells and not a punch clock were oftentimes regarded as bohemians, or worse, simply loafers who contributed nothing to society. Even in the 1970s, surfers were regarded with a dismissive eye by some within more established professions. I recall once when I was taking an English course in college, and the professor lamented that surfers offered nothing good to society versus, using his somewhat questionable example, those who write poetry. I objected and raised my hand to protest, arguing that watching a surfer on a wave can be as poetic and aesthetically pleasing as anything written by Shakespeare. This response of mine didn't settle well with the professor who protested that I was being blasphemous to what he held to be a sacred subject, the writer's ability to conjure magic from 26 letters. Yet, I persisted in my protest and said, what can be more beautiful than a surfer rhythmically gliding on a wave generated from thousands of miles away performing an instinctual dance that adapts to the bending contours of cascading water molecules? But my rather amateur attempt to use words as a weaponry defense didn't help my cause, and I was summarily dismissed as a hopeless and, and I am sure to his eye, useless, beach slouch. I bring this up in a historical context because to be a surfer today is easy and is welcomed in most quarters as a wonderful and healthy activity. Surfing today has become a leisure sport enjoyed by millions. But in Tom Blake's day, it was a radical departure from the norm to follow the ocean's ebb and flow and not the workaday time clock. The famed novelist and playwright Somerset Maugham touched upon this recurring theme of living out one's chosen dream versus what society dictates in his famous 1944 novel, The Razor's Edge, later turned into two movies. One good, the 1946 black and white version starring Tyrone Power, and one fairly awful, the 1984 color version featuring, quite implausibly, Bill Murray in the lead role. Mom speaks of an American who, sickened by what he witnessed during World War I as an Air Force pilot, opts to go in search truth by traveling around Europe and India, only to later settle down as a taxi driver back in the United States. When I saw the 1946 film with my mother one afternoon, I remember her disparging a side about the lead character. Oh, he is just a bum and should get a regular job. I can well imagine Tom Blake must have suffered similar insults during his time, especially given his devotion to the ocean. Surfing, as some commentators have written before, is like an anxious mistress that needs constant attention lest one neglect what she has to offer at her most alluring and charming moments. Tom Blake saw through the educational system with its Pavlovian grading system of pluses and demerits and felt strongly that a life revolving around the sea was a deeper and richer education. In a very pregnant note addressed to surf riders and swimmers, Blake provides a deep and pregnant critique of our schools. The knowledge you get in schools and colleges is secondhand. The wisdom and knowledge you get from the sea and waves and water is original and new and fitting. By all means, get some of this kind of education. As a college professor for over 30 years, I quite agree with Tom Blake. Since most of what we need to learn and what should learn is not taught in our universities, we have lost much by not paying deeper attention to nature and its more wild and pristine manifestations. We have become stale and complacent and, not surprisingly, less attentive and aware of how nature actually works. We have, in sum, buffered ourselves with pseudo-intellectualism and have lost our more natural bearings in the exchange. 
Tom Blake also appears to have suffered some sort of traumatic experience when quite young, which led him to live a life on his own terms and not merely mimic his more conventional-minded peers. What exactly happened is unclear, and one can only speculate about what transformed his outlook. Blake clearly sees the ocean as his refuge and as his guide, and it was in its depths that he found his true religion, one not predicated upon prior religious authority but by direct experience. For Blake, nature is God, and aligning one's lifestyle to it is the highest form of worship. The Sea as Teacher When I was a young man, I fell from social grace, or rather was pushed into deep water. Thereafter, I became a rebel of the society that had taken so much advantage of a well-meaning youth. I soon found that even deep water supports a rebel, if he has the will and ability to swim, regardless of race, color, creed. At times I found the water good, better than the land I was cut off from, the blessings of nature superior and more honest and productive to happiness than the striving to conform. Thus I came to know my God. Tom Blake, July 7, 1968 Thank you.